This is the Old Time Gospel Hour, program 421, regular version. From the auditorium of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, the faith partners and friends present Jerry Falwell and the Old Time Gospel Hour, celebrating 25 years of Christian ministry. Would you remain standing as we all sing together that last stanza? We've been going through a very difficult time here in this ministry. I personally have been going through a difficult time. These have been days of pressure and, and a great deal of opposition, criticism. And what a friend I have found Jesus to be over and over again through my 28 years as a Christian. The last words of that last stanza rather are, are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I want all of you to sing that last stanza right from your heart. And whatever your need, your problem may be, take it to him. That's exactly what I do, what I am doing through these difficult and hard times. The words will be on the screen, so all who are watching by television should sing it with us. Brother Moon. Thank you, and you may be seated. Nineteen eighty is now almost history. The elections of nineteen eighty will long be remembered. But you and I, as Christians, have a clear biblical mandate. The powers that be are ordained of God. And we're told to honor the king and all who are in authority to pray for them. I want to challenge you and my fr Christian friends across this nation. Let's pray for all the senators, the members of the House of Representatives, the president, the vice president. Let's pray for all the newly elected officials as they will be assuming their office in a matter of weeks. Let's ask God to give them the wisdom that they will need to lead our country in these crucial days ahead. I have said that I believe the 1980s to be a decade of destiny. If America survives this decade, it will be because God intervened, because we experienced a spiritual awakening. Second Chronicles 7, 14, because God healed our land. I do not think we can heal ourselves. I think progress has been made this year through prayer, through the involvement of believers. But I believe the hard work is yet ahead, addressing the moral issues. You know, a few years ago, God gripped my heart about leading the way, challenging thousands of pastors to get involved in somehow bringing this nation back to moral sanity. I've preached long and hard on the moral issues preaching against abortion, trying to represent unborn babies who by the millions are being slaughtered in our country legally. They call it abortion. That's not a popular stand to take, but it's a right stand. Pornography, we believe it's the poison of the human spirit and mind in America today and is wrecking the moral value systems of young people. 
We've stood against it. We must continue to stand against it. We've taken our stand for the family, the traditional family. Yes, we have a friend in Jesus, and I've needed his friendship. Many of you have stood with us. But I have determined under God I'm not going to turn back. Most of you know that it has been hard, but I want to tell you that I'm also human. It's good to know you're standing with me and praying for me. And we'll be preaching in just a few moments on living in the hour of trouble. That applies to all of us. These are troublous times. I'll be asking you for a vote of confidence. I know that I have the Lord as my friend. It certainly helps to know I have you as my friend too. And I'll be asking you, I've written many of you personal letters, asking you to give us a vote of confidence during these days that you'll be praying with us and standing behind us as we try to lead the way in turning this nation around. There will be heavy assaults from all sides in the days ahead. Knowing we have the Lord and hopefully because of your vote of confidence, which I'm going to ask for, knowing we have you standing by us, we'll enter 1981 trusting God for things that have never happened before in a nation like ours. A return to God, a return to biblical principles, a return to moral sanity. You know, we just sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. The one thing about Jesus is that you can talk to him intimately and personally. We pray to God through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many times in the hours of the day and the night have we had just a little talk with Jesus and that made it all right? Just a closer walk with thee. The choir led by David Randall. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let
we are approaching Christmas time when we remember that wonderful occasion that happened in the Bethlehem manger 2,000 years ago, the birth, the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we do every year here in Lynchburg, we will again this year uh, give the performance of the living Christmas tree. You want to be here. The dates are December 12 through 14, right here in this auditorium, the living Christmas tree, December 12, 13, and 14. Also, Dr. B.R. Lakin, Don Norman, and I are leading a tour to Israel. We're going to Cairo, Egypt, of course, to the pyramids there, and on to Rome, Italy, February 16 through 26. And if you'd like a free Holy Land brochure to go with us on that tour, an unforgettable experience, call us on our toll-free number, and we will send you that Holy Land brochure, 1-800-446-5000. I might also say to any of the educators who are watching, if you'd like to be teaching in a school like Liberty Baptist College, in areas like business, education, English, speech, music, math, Bible and theology, psychology, television, radio and film, physical ed, we have places for you if you love the Lord and you're walking with God and you believe in what we believe in, committed to what we're committed to, if you have a Ph.D., that helps from an accredited school or a master's plus. We just have you write to the office of the president, Liberty Baptist College, Lynchburg, for information. We have nearly 8 million people wearing this Jesus First lapel pen. And I'll send you two of these bronze lapel pens. That's all the pen says, Jesus First, two words. We'll send you two of them upon request by calling our toll-free number. Uh, there's no charge for them, no charge for the phone call. One for you, one for a loved one. We'll send both of them to you today upon request. So dial us and ask for two of the Jesus First lapel pens and then to testify to the unredeemed, to testify to Christians, to testify, period, perpetually, that he is the preeminent person in your life. Join eight million others who are wearing that pen everywhere. Jesus First. The T on First forms a cross. It's our way of saying everywhere we belong to those people who claim Jesus as Lord, unashamedly. So we look for your phone call. If you live in Virginia, Hawaii, Alaska, or Canada, you need to write us here in Lynchburg, Virginia. Ask for the pens. Whether calling or writing, do it today. We have some very special friends here. They've come here from many states and uh, from all over the, the country and from Canada and other places. We call them faith partners. They're the backbone of this ministry. Faith partners pray for us regularly. Faith partners are the ones who give $10 a month or more to support our television radio programs on more television radio stations than any program like ours in history. And through their monthly giving and their daily prayers, these faith partners are the backbone of this ministry. I'd like for all the faith partners in this auditorium to stand right now, would you? Every one of you who's a faith partner, everywhere, just stand right now. And I want you to see who the people are who stand behind us, who make this thing possible. God bless you, the choir, everybody. Beautiful sight. Faith partners, we're so thrilled to have you with us today. And uh, we thank you for your prayers and giving. You may be seated. If you happen to be watching by television and you'd like to maybe consider becoming a faith partner and holding up my hands, helping me to get this message of the gospel out to the world and our generation, call us on our toll-free number and ask for information about becoming a faith partner. That doesn't mean you're going to become one, but we'll tell you all about it. Whoever answers the phone will explain to you what a faith partner is. And then if you want to join the team, you can do that. And I hope that many of you will. Right now, my friend Jack Price is here. Jack and I have been friends for many years. We've worked together in evangelistic crusades. He's one of the great gospel singers of our day. And it's just a real privilege to have this young man who sings the gospel. That's his whole ministry now in churches, music evangelism. Everywhere he sings, people get saved. Lives get changed. And that's what singing is all about. That's what gospel music is all about. So I want you to give a warm welcome to our friend, Jack Price. Jack, good to have you. I've learned 
to know a name I highly treasure. Oh, how it thrills my spirit through and through. Oh, precious name, beyond degree or measure. Of him so kind and true, my heart is stirred when I think of Jesus, that blessed name which sets the captive free. I find salvation no name on earth has meant so much to me if I could find the right words to say to tell you just what Christ means to me. I'd say he's more than I could show and more than you. more to me than I could possibly show more, more, so much more, he's more than you. Mr. Jack Price, oh boy, what an uplift. If I could just carry Jack along to sing that to me now, but once a day, the hard parts of the day. How beautiful, thank God for good gospel music. We've been talking about how years ago, God laid upon our heart to challenge the moral decadence, the moral decline that has been gripping America. So we began back in 1974, 75, traveling the nation with about 70 Liberty Baptist College young people in big I Love America rallies in coliseums, stadiums, anywhere and everywhere. Through the years, we've been crying out louder and more often. We really did not expect, we must praise God for this, we did not expect that so quickly the country would begin responding from the highest levels of government right down to the lowest echelons of society. But those kinds of things have been happening. You faith partners have had a part in that. Your prayers have meant much, all of you who stood with us. But things have begun to happen, and I really do believe that this nation is not too far away from a spiritual awakening. Much has to happen yet, but at least we're beginning to see a consciousness today that wasn't here two years ago. 
a consciousness of morality, of the family, of right, of wrong, of decency, of integrity. And good things are happening and we praise God for it. But we also did not anticipate, I'm glad we didn't because we probably wouldn't have tried it. We did not anticipate the, uh, the, the strength of the opposition. We did not have the faintest idea how much wrath we could stir up when we began to hammer away on these issues. For example, the pornography industry last year, legal porn, legal pornography, I'm talking about the, the dirty magazines and newspapers, legally grossed $4 billion last year, $4,000 million. Well, they didn't take us seriously till lately. Suddenly they see that $4 billion in jeopardy. They don't take that lying down. So right away, we're under vicious attack from that group. The abortion clinics, we're told, grossed $2 billion last year for murdering one and a half million babies in America, legally. They see that money disappearing if in fact, as happened here in Virginia, did you know yesterday, your governor vetoed use of tax monies for abortions in this state, Virginia? God bless Governor Dalton. But they see this happening across the nation now. And they don't take that lying down either. I've been battling with the sex educators. I'm for sex education if it's taught as a biological science. Reproduction, hygiene, puberty, all the young people need to be taught that, of course, from a dignified and scientific level. Sex education today in many of our schools is nothing in the world but academic pornography. I proved that on the Today Show the other morning uh, with uh, a gentleman who produces some of that literature. Things we couldn't put on NBC is being taught to our children in classrooms, captive audience. But I want to tell you that's big business too. And all the publishers don't like that. If we are able, along with the Gablers in Longview, Texas and others, to shut down pornography and, and, and the kind of sex education that's happening in our country that's bad for boys and girls, it's going to cost people some dollars because they'll have to start making an honest living doing something else. The drug traffic in this country, these fellows who are pushing and peddling drugs are murdering little children on the installment plan. They need to be shut down. Well, they don't take that lying down either. And on and on the list goes. And politicians who represent those kinds of people are finding it hard to maneuver because people are becoming more intelligent, more sophisticated, and as good Christians, they're becoming good citizens. The politicians don't take it lying down. And the press hasn't taken it lying down. I brought a box to the pulpit. There's no bomb in it, so rest easy. But inside this box, there are several hundred newspaper clippings. I asked them, we, there have been thousands of newspaper clippings about us, and I got them to put some of them in a box for me, and we picked out a little while ago the worst ones. They're all bad. Uh, not all of them bad, but all, in this box they are. We brought the bad ones here. There have been some good ones too, and I want to say that in fairness to the press, of course. But to give you an idea, here's a clipping from the, uh, what's with my glasses, Don? Okay. All right. Okay, the Franklin Oil City, Pennsylvania News Herald. Headline, born again Ayatollahs should be told off. Ayatollahs, they've called us that. Here's one from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania News. Headline, the political gospel according to Falwell, creating problems. Here's another one from the Alexandria, Virginia Gazette, The Dangerous Doctrine of Reverend Jerry Falwell. All we're doing is telling folks that we need to come back to moral sanity, that, that the husband-wife relationship is the best approach, that abortion is bad, pornography is bad, drugs are bad. But we're hurting the trade of some people. Here's one from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It says, the headline, Manipulating the Bible. Then here's one from Warsaw, Wisconsin, Warsaw, Merrill, Wisconsin, Herald. 
clergymen oppose trend of right-wing Christians. Even some preachers have come out against us. Can you imagine preachers being against preachers who are speaking out against immorality? And yet here's some clergymen who've done that. Here's one fellow whose headline talking about us says, I think it's a dangerous thing. Well, I imagine it is if you're doing wrong. <laughs> Here's one in the Lynchburg, Virginia newspaper. Now, once in a while, Lynchburg will write something bad about us. <laughs> Lynchburg, Virginia news. Controversy swirls around tactics of Christian right. Why are we called right-wingers when we just believe in the family, morality, traditional Christianity, the Judeo-Christian ethic? Now here's somebody who's really coming at West Palm Beach Times. Headline is, Electronic Minister Exemption Questioned. Tax exemption they're talking about. Now our tax exemption is even being questioned and challenged by some. It's okay for the National Council of Churches to say what they're saying. Jesse Jackson defended us on a national show the other day. He's a reverend. He's out in, in some very strong political involvement. He said they have the right to do what they're doing also, and I appreciate Jesse Jackson saying that, but nobody else is criticizing Jesse, just us. Nobody criticizes Dr. Martin Luther King for leading that noble effort of 20 years ago. He was a minister. But today we're dealing with moral issues that hit some people in the pocketbook. But we've got to do that, and we cannot turn back. I've written a letter to my friends everywhere. This is one of them right here. It says highly confidential on the bottom. And inside, I've asked for a vote of confidence from our friends. That's all, just a vote of confidence. Saying, yes, Jerry, you have my vote of confidence. I will stand beside you. Please continue to speak out against the moral cancers destroying our nation. I hope that every one of you will send that back. I would like to have a few million people saying, Jerry, we're praying for you. We're standing with you. I need your prayers more now than ever. I need your financial support more now than ever. I've been traveling five to 8,000 miles a week. I traveled 10,000 miles since last Sunday, one week ago. I've traveled 10,000 miles. I've preached in many states. I don't know how many times. And uh, we've lost some friends over this. There are some who are saying, hey, preacher, let somebody else do that. Uh, but who's the somebody else who's going to do it? The question is, if we back up, who's going to stand up? Somebody's got to stand up and just keep standing up. And I had a friend of mine right here in this church who said, Jerry, you're going to get all blooded and bruised, and it's going to hurt you. They're going to really hammer you. It's gonna, uh, my suggestion to you is to, is to step down. Let somebody else do that. He's a friend of mine. But that reminds me of what Peter said to Jesus when he tried to keep him from the cross. Get thee behind me, Satan. I think it's Satan who tries to make us quit and stop in the middle of the stream. We cannot quit. We must go on. But I do need your prayers and your help. We've lost some friends over this who don't want us involved. There was an article in the Lynchburg paper this past week. An insurance company was having some legal difficulties. We are one of the clients. We have our people here, a group insurance plan under that company. I found out later that much of what was written wasn't accurate about the company, but that's neither here nor there. The important thing is, how does that relate to us? The headline said something like this, uh, insurance company which insures or covers Falwell's organizations in trouble. Now, how did Falwell's organizations get into that? There are thousands of clients. Thank God I wasn't driving a Chrysler. <laughs> uh, the uh, headline... <laughs> I am driving a General Motors, and I'm watching their stock closely. <laughs> I'll dump it if they get in trouble. What I'm telling you is the heat's on, and people don't play fair. We don't expect them to play fair. We do expect to keep ourselves right and straight. And if others want to be uneth unethical and unprofessional and dishonest, that's up to them. We want to stand, and I need, nev as never before, my Christian friends to stand with me, praying for me, and we've been this, because I've been working so hard out there on the field, our finances have been down the last couple of months, and we need to hear from our friends as we never have before. Now, word to the wise is sufficient. Our address is on the screen. 
And our address is simply Lynchburg, Virginia, and your checks are made payable to Old Time Gospel Hour. Just to help us because we need your help right now. I'm not going to say any more than that, but we just cannot allow the enemy to put us down or shut us down because of need of funds. And I'm just saying heart to heart to you, I need a letter from you. I need you to make a sacrificial gift, and I need it now, and I need it badly. That's all I'm going to say. Just before our message today, Don Norman comes to sing. Normally, I don't say anything. Many years ago when I came to work with Dr. Falwell, he says, you sing and I'll talk, and that's the way it's been most of the time. But this morning, I want to talk to you just a few moments before we sing. The forces of evil are against this man like never before, and we need a vote of confidence from you folk in this auditorium and for those of you who are watching throughout the Old Time Gospel Hour audience. This is the first letter I've ever written to many of you, but I've written a letter and ask you for a vote of confidence at this time. I was just reading this morning in the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. When Moses had sent out Joshua to fight against Amalek, and Moses had gone on the top of the hill with Aaron and Hur. And when he'd hold up his hands, the forces of Israel would prevail. But when his hands fell, the forces of Amalek prevailed. And Aaron and Hur seated Moses on a rock and then held up his hands, and the forces of Israel prevailed throughout. And what I'm simply asking all of us here, and you in the audience there, in the television audience, to hold up this man's hands. He needs your prayers. He needs a vote of confidence. And we trust that God will lay it heavily upon your heart to do that. Brother Jerry, we love you. And I want to sing this song for you this morning. Someone, someone is praying for you. clouds round you gathered in the midst of the storm is your ship tossed and battered are you weary and worn don't lose hope someone's praying for you this very day and peace be still is already on the way someone is praying for you someone is praying for you so when it seems you're all alone and your heart would break in two, oh, someone is praying for you. And maybe sometimes we all have prayed till it seems like that our strength is completely gone. And many times the tears may fall like raindrops all the day long. But listen, listen. Jesus cares and he knows just how much we can bear. And he'll speak your name to someone in prayer. Oh, someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. 
So when it seems you're all alone And your heart would break in two Oh, someone is praying Yes, someone is praying Remember, someone is praying Pray So when everything seems to be going wrong, everybody seems to be against us. Jerry, just remember, someone, all of us here, are praying for you, sir. We love you. Thank you, Don, and thank you, each and every one of you. I am most certainly assured of your prayers, and I assure you I value them. I treasure them. And to all of our friends, millions across the nation, Canada, Australia, Philippines, the islands of the Caribbean, I know you pray. I suppose that's our secret weapon, isn't it? In every battle, I suppose the Christian who's being prayed for and who knows how to pray has the advantage. It's a fair advantage. It's a heavenly advantage. It's a scriptural advantage. Fortunately, it's available to everyone who will trust him. In the second book of Corinthians, chapter 11, page 1710 in the Faith Partner Study Bible. The great Apostle Paul, who knew something of pressures and problems and trials and troubles, said, I speak as concerning reproach. The word reproach has two possible translations other than the word reproach. One is the word criticism. I speak as concerning criticism. The other is the word trouble. I speak as concerning trouble. Paul the Apostle was an expert on either case. As though we had been weak, Paul adds, how be it or however, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That's thirty-nine stripes. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice or three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils or dangers in the city, in perils or dangers in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And then he adds, in weariness, the great apostle was tired at times, in painfulness, he heard at times, in watchings often, that means sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And then he added this verse, beside those things that are without. And those were enough to kill ten men. That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, the oversight of all the churches. In other words, besides all those pressures and, and problems and troubles, he said, I had my ministry to perform. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray for others who are in trouble today, 
friends, loved ones, people, all kinds of people who need our help. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you'll give them as they trust you the help they need. And help us somehow, millions of us who love you, help us to join hands to bring this nation back to that place where you can once more bless America, heal our land, and help us bless the world for whom your son Jesus died. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The Apostle Paul had learned the secret of drawing upon the strength of Christ. In the next chapter, chapter 12, Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, my sicknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul had learned that when I am weak, verse 10, chapter 12, when I am weak, then am I strong. What did he mean by that? He had been through so much, he had endured so much, he had felt and, and suffered so much that he had learned to draw not from himself but from the living Christ. It was the same apostle who said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was the same apostle who said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He had learned that, that through his own experiences. You know, as I read his pedigree of problems, it embarrasses me, it humbles me that I ever complain. Uh, Paul didn't have uh, the political uh, intertwinings that we face today. And uh, there were many things unique to his day that were, are not common to ours. Uh, he was beaten. He was... Uh, uh, five times beaten with rods, uh, three times beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was thrown overboard. He suffered shipwreck. He had many sleepless nights, all those kinds of things. And through all of that, he carried on his ministry. I'm telling pastors everywhere whom God is using to help bring this nation not only to the awareness of the gospel, and that's first and foremost. Getting people saved is always the main thing but also to hold up a standard of righteousness. I'm telling them that we must learn the issues, we must learn the Word of God, and we must be willing to face opposition. We have been favored, really, by, in the main part, objective press people. Uh, when they report what others are saying, they have an obligation to do that. Uh, the press in America has not been unkind to this preacher. Uh, they have reported what others have done and said who have been unkind, but the press has not been unkind. And in most cases, uh, we, on any given service around here, we'll have four, five, six, sometimes a dozen members of the press uh, crawling around the platform or down front or shooting shots, and we're always glad to have them because they're here uh, reporting a phenomenon that there is something going on in America in fundamental Bible-believing Christianity that may very well affect the whole world, and I think it will. We have with us today, we have members of the press from ITV in England, London, England. We have them here from the Dutch press. We have them here from France, television crews and so on. Friends who are here to report what is going on here. This happens daily. We're glad. Over the years, as you know, I have been very outspoken on the moral issues that I think count. The Apostle Paul was sort of that way. Well, uh, suddenly I find myself often and openly attacked by people from all walks of life, from the political realm from, uh, to, the, to the business realm and other areas who don't like what we're doing. Recently, in order to clear the air, we held a national press conference here in Lynchburg. Several years ago, as a minister, I preached against ministers getting involved in moral and social issues that had become political. It was my conviction then that uh, things would straighten out themselves and just by osmosis, if we would uh, pray and preach, uh, the country would correct its own ills. Uh, that proved to be a false prophecy. And uh, I found myself several years ago doing what I'd preached against over a decade ago. I suppose the, the real catalyst that, uh, that activated me into into involvement would be the 1973 Roe versus Wade decision of the Supreme Court legalizing abortion on demand. That was not the first thing 
I'd watched what had happened in our public schools since the, uh, the Madeleine O'Hare court ruling that removed voluntary or any other Bible reading and prayer from public schools. But particularly, the abortion ruling was uh, that uh, catalyst that uh, stirred me and thousands like me most. We didn't know what to do about it because it became political. We didn't make abortion political. It uh, became political by act of the Supreme Court, but it is very much political now. We happen to be uh, in favor of protecting the life of an unborn baby from conception uh, till death of old age or whatever. Uh, if that is a bad, uh, if that's a crime, then we plead guilty. Uh, but we're going to keep doing it. And that isn't a Roman Catholic Church issue. We've let them fight that battle by themselves too long, to our discredit. Uh, we are against pornography. If someone were poisoning the water uh, reservoir here in Lynchburg, we'd send the militia after it. We let the Hugh Hefners and the Larry Flints pour the poison at the minds and hearts of our young people. And when somebody speaks out against it, uh, they cry censorship. We're not after that. When I began preaching 28 years ago, pornography uh, was something that was available in the back dark halls of pool rooms. Uh, today it's on Main Street, $4 billion legal industry last year in this country. And I think it's the poison of the American soul and mind. I think pornography is probably doing more to damage the moral values of young people than any other one factor in this country. The homosexual revolution certainly has been a matter of great concern to me and thousands of uh, pastors like myself. We do not abhor or dislike homosexuals. We abhor homosexuality. Ministers have never had a problem distinguishing between offenses and the offenders. We have an alcoholic institution here in this city where for years we have taken alcoholic men free for 60 days of uh, spiritual uh, therapy. We've never charged them. We tell them when they come in that the excessive use of alcoholic beverages is wrong, but we like you and we work with them and we help them back to a meaningful uh, and rehabilitated lifestyle. And uh, beyond that, I don't think that the television networks are producing programs that present life the way it is in America. I think instead that writers are presenting life the way they live it and the way they wish everybody else did. And I think that leaders and the ministry and the media have an obligation to help people up, not down. We have a commitment during the 1980s uh, to attempt to bring about a moral uh, regeneration in this country. I didn't hear any of the liberals who are crying out against me saying a thing when Dr. Martin Luther King and hundreds of ministers were leading the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Nobody was bothered by that. Nobody has said a word about Jesse Jackson visiting Africa and uh, visiting the, the Middle East countries and his involvement in politics here. He's a minister of the gospel. I certainly haven't criticized him. I think he has the right to do that. The problem is that a little minority has been jamming their amoral lifestyle and designs down our throats while we, the majority, thinking in frustration that we don't count, have sat back and allowed them to do it. We're to blame. We don't blame anybody but us. But we have decided, as Pat Harris said, to enter the political process. And the thing that they don't realize about our people is that the more you kick us and the more you criticize us and the more you lie about us, uh, the larger we get. And that happens to be the, the role that we play today. We're the underdog. We're, we're a silent uh, group out there who hasn't been involved. 84% of all Americans last December in a Gallup poll said uh, that we believe the Ten Commandments are valid for today. I suspect that was the same percentage that believed that back in 1776. I don't think the people have gone wrong. I think the leadership has. I believe that everything I told the press is a fact. I believe that America has not gone wrong, that the people still know right from wrong, that people still believe in the family. I believe that what I've been saying to the press and what I've been saying on these programs is so, that all America is waiting for, and I say this to my preacher friends everywhere, like Paul, the oversight of the churches, let us as pastors stand up for that which is right and under God no matter how much fire we draw. Let's turn the country around. There are 330,000 pastors in America. We're not going to get everybody. There are a few out in left field that, to the left of Brezhnev. You're not going to change them. But thank God there are many great preachers in America who know what's right, know what's wrong, and believe the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and believe in the deity of Christ, who know how to pray, who can make the difference. All that's needed is a little holy boldness, a little courage. 
And preachers, I want to challenge you to become courageous. Recently, I was speaking to some 15,000 ministers and, and church leaders and community leaders in Dallas. And I told them that what America really needs today is a mighty spiritual awakening. We have not had a spiritual awakening in more than 100 years. But I think I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand on the horizon. And I think I, I think I sense what Governor Clement so nobly said, a moving of God's spirit and a movement by God's people in the direction God is going. And when people begin to cooperate with what God is doing, you have an unbeatable combination. I am firmly convinced that nothing is too hard for the Lord. What I'm saying to preachers, what I'm saying to the press is the same I'm saying to you. The permanent hope for America is a spiritual awakening. That's why we're planning, uh, planning to start 5,000 new churches in North America in the next few years. And that's why we're sending missionaries around the world. That's why we want to have 50,000 students out there at Liberty Mountain in our Liberty Baptist College, Seminary, Institute, and Schools. Because we want to train them to be champions for Christ, go out and start Christian businesses, go as Christians into the political realm and help lead our nation. We want to send them out as missionaries worldwide. We want to send them out into television, into journalism. We want to send them out to every field. Cal Thomas is sitting right down here. Cal Thomas was an NBC newsman for years. And uh, God just spoke to his heart that, you know, I'd like to spend the rest of my life, my wife and our children, serving God and using my talent for the Lord. So he joined us here in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, we're glad uh, that all over the nation good things are happening like that. But we need to train a generation of young men and young women in all the various facets and all the, facet, uh, the, the various uh, vocations so that we can in the next few years have the long-range plan working. Now, why am I crying out on the issues? You can't have revival until there's Holy Spirit conviction. You cannot have Holy Spirit conviction until there's awareness of sin. And how are we going to know what sin is if the preachers don't stand up and tell the people what it is? And that is what we're trying to do. And I think that preachers across America have got to stand up and say, hey, if, if everybody stands against me, I'm going to stand with God. If we'll do that, the young people will take the cue. If we'll do that, the boys and girls are ready. We are, more students are enrolling at Liberty Baptist than we can accommodate. Our problem is not uh, where to get students. Our problem is what to do with them. And they come here and we tell them how to walk and talk and uh, how to date. We tell them what they can wear and what they can't wear. And we teach them to say, yes, sir, and no, sir. We teach them respect for God, for the country, for the flag, for their parents, for the establishment, for government. And they love it. Young people haven't gone bad. Just some facets of leadership. And we need to change the leadership. We need to get parents who are supposed to be godly leaders doing just that. We need to get pastors doing that. We need to get politicians doing that. We need to get the business community doing that. Let's lead the way. And under God, let's turn our country around. And preachers, besides all of this, you and I have our churches to pastor and our ministries to perform, leading people to know Jesus, leading people to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. 2,000 years ago, our Savior died upon a cross to keep us out of hell. He died in my place. He died in yours. He was buried. He rose again three days later to give us life eternal. I buried one of our little 16-year-old girls, Wendy Hamilton, last Wednesday. She's in heaven today. Thank God she was saved right here, as were her mother and daddy and brother. That doesn't stop the tears from flowing, but thank God we saw her not as others who have no hope. I buried one of our nearly, he was just about a charter member, started with us right back at the beginning, Arthur Kessler, Friday. 72 years old. We'll sure miss him, but thank God we know where he is. We haven't lost him. We know where he is. He's in heaven. And his wife, Bessie, will go right on living. That's the wonderful work we're in, telling the whole world about Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. 
And while every head is bowed, how many of you will say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I know it. I thank God for it, I'm not ashamed to say so. If I die today, I'm as sure for heaven as if I were already there. Would you raise your hand high, please? God bless every one of you. If you could not lift your hand, I'd like to pray for you. God answers prayer. If you're not a Christian or you are a Christian but you haven't been living for the Lord as you should of late, and as a Christian or a non-Christian, you'd like to be prayed for right now that you'll know when you stand before God, you'll hear him say, well done. Lift your hand, please. I'll pray for you all over this building, whoever you are, whatever your needs. God bless every one of you. And there sitting in the pew or by the television set, if you need Christ as your Savior, invite him into your heart right now. Believe the death, burial, resurrection of Christ in your behalf. Trust him as your Savior right now. And then write me if you're at home and ask for a free copy of my booklet, How to Get Started Right. If you want one of our pastors to call you and share the gospel with you at our expense, give us your telephone number. If you have a prayer request, our prayer warriors will pray for you by name and we'll write you personally. Just write us your prayer request, whatever's on your heart. Let us pray for you as you pray for us in these difficult times. Let us stand to pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, because of Calvary, because of the shed blood, because of our Savior, we pray that every man, woman, boy, girl in this auditorium and watching by television who needs salvation will trust Jesus right now. Help Christians to repent and rededicate their lives. Meet the need of every man, woman, boy, girl in this building. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, the pastors are here at the front to meet you. If you need to come to trust Jesus as your Savior, you want to rededicate your life to the Lord and start over, or you'd like to unite with our church today, you want to become a Thomas Roeder, help us get the work done here in Lynchburg and around the world as one of us. From the balconies or the main floor, just step out and come, please, right now and meet us. We'll go with you to a private prayer room, pray with you and help you. While we sing, will you come? Amen. Thank God for these who are coming. What about you? You have been watching the Old Time Gospel Hour originating from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. If you would like an audio cassette of today's program, write to Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514, and enclose a $4 donation. Request program number 421. To become a faith partner and receive this beautiful faith partner Bible, Call toll-free 1-800-446-5000 for complete information. Once again, that free number is 1-800-446-5000. Now, this is John Corrigan inviting you to join us next week for another telecast of the Old Time Gospel Hour. And until then, may God richly bless you is our prayer. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System. <laughs>